Black Clock Audio Tales, edited by Daniel Spitzer. Black Clock Audio Tales is a PGTTCM production. Join us in our exploration of old ghost stories, supernatural fiction, horror tales, folk tales, fantasy, the gothic tradition, weird tales, and cosmic horror. Look for the podcast behind the loose brick on the north end of the Black Clock Tower, or wherever you find your podcasts. We suggest Podbean or Apple Podcasts. Help keep Black Clock Audio Tales running smoothly by donating five to ten bucks to paypal.me slash pgttcm. The title track is The Chamber by Kevin McLeod. Find us on the web at pgttcm.com and at Black Clock Audio on Instagram, Twitter, and the Facebook. And Black Clock Audio Tales on YouTube. Welcome to Black Clock Audio Tales. Lot 249 by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle Of the dealings of Edward Bellingham with William Monkhouse Lee, and of the cause of the great terror of Abercrombie Smith, it may be that no absolute and final judgment will ever be delivered. It is true that we have the full and clear narrative of Smith himself, and such corroboration as he could look for from Thomas Stiles, the servant, from the Reverend Plumtree Peterson, fellow of olds, and from other such people, as chanced to gain some passing glance at this or that incident in a singular chain of events. Yet in the main, the story must rest upon Smith alone, and the most will think that it is more likely that one brain, however outwardly sane, has some subtle warp in its texture, some strange flaw in its workings, than that the path of nature has been overstepped in open day in so famed a centre of learning and light as the University of Oxford. Yet when we think how narrow and how devious this path of nature is, how dimly we can trace it for all our lamps of science, and how from the darkness which girds it round great and terrible possibilities loom ever shadowly upwards, it is a bold and confident man who will put a limit to the strange bypaths into which the human spirit may wander. In a certain wing of what we will call Old College in Oxford, there is a corner of turret of an exceeding great age. The heavy arch which spans the open door has bent downwards in the centre under the weight of its years, and the grey lichen blotched blocks of stone are bound and knitted together with writhes and strands of ivy as though the old mother had herself to brace them up against the wind and weather. From the door, a stone staircase curves upward spirally, passing two landings and terminating in a third one, its steps all shapeless and hollowed by the tread of so many generations of the seekers after knowledge. Life has flowed like water down this winding stair, and water-like has left those smooth, worn groves behind it. From the long-gowned pedantic scholars of Plantagenet days down to the young bloods of a later age, how full and strong had been that tide of young English life, and what was left now of all those hopes, those strivings, those fiery energies, save here and there, in some old-world churchyard, a few scratches upon a stone, and perchance a handful of dust in a mouldering coffin. Yet here were the silent stair and the grey old wall, with bend and saltire, and many other heraldic device still to be read upon its surface, like grotesque shadows thrown back from the days that had passed. In the month of May in the year 1884, three young men occupied the sets of rooms which opened onto the separate landings of the old stair. Each set consisted simply of a sitting room and of a bedroom, while two corresponding rooms upon the ground floor were used the one as a coal cellar, and the other as the living room of the servant, or Jip, Thomas Stiles, whose duty it was to wait upon the three men above him. To right and to left was a line of lecture rooms and of offices, 
so that the dwellers in the old turret enjoyed a certain seclusion, which made the chambers popular among the more studious undergraduates. Such were the three who occupied them now, Abercrombie Smith above, Edward Bellingham beneath him, and William Monkhouse Lee upon the lowest story. It was ten o'clock on a bright spring night, and Abercrombie Smith lay back in his armchair, his feet upon the fender and his briar root pipe between his lips. In a similar chair, and equally at his ease, there lounged on the other side of the fireplace his old school friend, Jeffro Hasty. Both men were in flannels, for they had spent their evening upon the river, but apart from their dress, no one could look at their hard-cut, alert faces without seeing that they were open-air men, men whose minds and tastes turned naturally to all that was manly and robust. Hasty, indeed, was stroke of his college boat, and Smith was an even better oar, but a coming examination had already cast its shadow over him and held him to his work, save for the few hours a week which health demanded. A litter of medical books upon the table with scattered bones, models and anatomical plates pointed to the extent as well as the nature of his studies, while a couple of single sticks and a set of boxing gloves above the mantelpiece hinted at the means by which, with Hasty's help, he might take his exercise in its most compressed and least distant form. They knew each other very well, so well that they could sit now in that soothing silence which is the very highest development of companionship. Have some whisky, said Abercrombie Smith at last between two cloudbursts. Scotch in the jug and Irish in the bottle. No thanks, I'm in for the skulls. I don't liquor when I'm training. How about you? I'm reading hard. I think it's best to leave it alone. Hasty nodded and they relapsed into contented silence. By the way, Smith, asked Hasty presently, have you made the acquaintance of either of the fellows on your stair yet? Just a nod when we pass, nothing more. Hmm, I should be inclined to let it stand at that. I know something of them both. Not much, but as much as I want. I don't think I should take them to my bosom if I were you. Not that there's much amiss with Monkhouse Lee. Meaning the thin one? Precisely. He's a gentlemanly little fellow. I don't think there's any vice in him, but then you can't know him without knowing Bellingham. Meaning the fat one? Yes, the fat one, and he's a man whom I for one would rather not know. Abercrombie Smith raised his eyebrows and glanced across at his companion. What's up then, he asked. Drink? Cards? Cad? You used to not be censorious. Now, you evidently don't know this man, or you wouldn't ask. There's something damnable about him, something reptilian. My gorge always rises at him. I should put him down as a man with secret vices, an evil liver. He's no fool, though. They say he is one of the best men in his line as yet that they have ever had in college. Medicine or classics? Eastern languages. He's a demon at them. Chillingworth met him somewhere above the second cataract last long, and he told me that he just prattled to the Arabs as if he had been born and nursed and weaned among them. He taught Coptic to the Copts, Hebrew to the Jews, and Arabic to the Bedouins, and they were all ready to kiss the hem of his frock coat. There are some old hermit johnnies up in those parts who sit on rocks and scowl and spit at the casual stranger. But when they saw this chap Bellingham, before he had said five words, they just lay down on their bellies and wriggled. Chillingworth said that he never saw anything like it. Bellingham seemed to take it his right too, and strutted about among them and talked down to them like a Dutch uncle. Pretty good for an undergrad of olds, wasn't it? Why do you say you can't know Lee without knowing Bellingham? Bellingham is engaged to his sister, Eveline. She's such a bright little girl, Smith. I know the whole family well. It's disgusting to see that brute with her. A toad and a dove, that's what they always remind me of. Abercrombie Smith grinned and knocked his ashes out against the side of the grate. You show every card in your hand, old chap, said he. What a prejudiced, green-eyed, evil-thinking old man it is. You have really nothing against the fellow except that. Well, I've known her ever since she was as long as that cherry wood pipe. I don't like to see her taking risks, and it is a risk. He looks beastly. He has a beastly temper, a venomous temper. You remember his row with Long Norton? No, you always forget that I am a freshman. Ah, it was last winter, of course. Well, you know the towpath along the river. There were several fellows going along it, Bellingham in front. And when they came on an old market woman coming up the other way, it had been raining. You know what those fields are like when it is rained. And the path ran between the river and a great puddle that was nearly as broad. 
Well, what does this swine do but keep the path and push the old girl into the mud, where she and her marketings came to terrible grief? It was a blackguard thing to do, and Long Norton, who was as gentle a fellow as ever stepped, told him what he thought of it. One word led to another, and it ended in Norton laying his stick across the fellow's shoulders. There was a deuce of a fuss about it, and it's a treat to see the way in which Bellingham looks at Norton when they meet now. By Jove, Smith, it's nearly eleven o'clock. No hurry, light your pipe again. No, I'm supposed to be in training. Here I've been sitting gossiping when I ought to have been safely tucked up. I'll borrow your skull if you can share it. Williams has had mine for a month. I'll take the little bones of your ear too, if you're sure you don't need them. Thanks very much. Never mind a bag. I can carry them very well under my arm. Good night, my son, and take my tip as to your neighbour. When Hasty, bearing his anatomical plunder, had clattered off down the winding stair, Abercrombie Smith hurled his pipe into the waste-paper basket, and drawing his chair nearer to the lamp, plunged into a formidable green-covered volume, adorned with great coloured maps of that strange internal kingdom of which we are the hapless and helpless monarchs. Though a freshman at Oxford, the student was not so in medicine, for he had worked for four years at Glasgow and at Berlin, and this coming examination would place him finally as a member of his profession. With his firm mouth, broad forehead, and clear-cut, somewhat hard-featured face, he was a man who, if he had no brilliant talent, was yet so dogged, so patient, and so strong, that he might in the end overtop a more showy genius. A man who can hold his own among Scotchmen and North Germans is not a man to be easily set back. Smith had left a name at Glasgow and at Berlin, and he was bent now upon doing as much at Oxford if hard work and devotion could accomplish it. He had sat reading for about an hour, and the hands of the noisy carriage clock upon the side table were rapidly closing together upon the twelve, and a sudden sound fell upon the student's ear, a sharp, rather shrill sound, like the hissing intake of a man's breath, who gasps under some strong emotion. Smith laid down his book and slanted his ear to listen. There was no one on either side or above him, so the interruption came certainly from the neighbour beneath the same neighbour of whom Hasty had given so unsavoury an account. Smith knew him only as a flabby, pale-faced man of silent and studious habits, a man whose lamp threw a golden bar from the old turret even after he had extinguished his own. This community in lateness had formed a certain silent bond between them. It was soothing to Smith that when the hours stole on towards dawning to feel that there was another so close who set a smaller value upon his sleep as he did. Even now, as his thoughts turned towards him, Smith's feelings were kindly. Hasty was a good fellow, but he was rough, strong-fibred, with no imagination or sympathy. He could not tolerate departures from what he looked upon as the model type of manliness. If a man could not be measured by a public school standard, then he was beyond the pale with Hasty. Like so many who are themselves robust, he was apt to confuse the constitution with character, to ascribe to want of principle what was really a want of circulation. Smith, with his stronger mind, knew his friend's habit, and made allowance for it now as his thoughts turned towards the man beneath him. There was no return of the singular sound, and Smith was about to turn to his work once more, when suddenly there broke out in the silence of the night a hoarse cry, a positive scream, the call of a man who is moved and shaken beyond all control. Smith sprang out of his chair and dropped his book. He was a man of fairly firm fibre, but there was something in this sudden, uncontrollable shriek of horror which chilled his blood and pringled in his skin. Coming in such a place and at such an hour, it brought a thousand fantastic possibilities to his head. Should he rush down, or was it better to wait? He had all the national hatred of making a scene, and he knew so little of his neighbour that he would not lightly intrude upon his affairs. For a moment he stood in doubt, and even as he balanced the matter, there was a quick rattle of footsteps upon the stairs, and young Monkhouse Lee, half-dressed and white as ashes, burst into his room. "'Come down,' he gasped. "'Bellingham's ill.' Abercrombie Smith followed him closely down the stairs into the sitting-room, which was beneath his own, and intent as he was upon the matter in hand, 
he could not but take an amazed glance around him as he crossed the threshold. It was such a chamber as he had never seen before, a museum rather than a study. Walls and ceiling were thickly covered with a thousand strange relics from Egypt and the East. Tall, angular figures bearing burdens or weapons stalked in an uncouth frieze around the apartments. Above were bull-headed, stork-headed, cat-headed, owl-headed statues, with viper-crowned, almond-eyed monarchs and strange beetle-like deities cut out of the blue Egyptian lapulus lazuli. Horus and Isis and Osiris peeped down from every niche and shelf, while across the ceiling a true son of old Nile, a great hanging-jawed crocodile, was slung in a double noose. In the centre of this singular chamber was a large square table littered with papers, bottles, and the dried leaves of some graceful palm-like plant. These varied objects had all been heaped together in order to make room for a mummy case, which had been conveyed from the wall, as was evident from the gap there, and laid across the front of the table. The mummy itself, a horrid black withered thing, like a charred head on a gnarled bush, was lying half out of the case, with its claw-like hand and bony forearm resting on the table. Propped up against the sarcophagus was an old yellow scroll of papyrus, and in front of it, in a wooden armchair, sat the owner of the room, his head thrown back, his widely open eyes directed in a horrified stare to the crocodile above him, and his blue thick lips puffing loudly with every expiration. "'My God, he's dying!' cried Monkhouse Lee distractedly. He was a slim, handsome fellow, olive-skinned and dark-eyed, of a Spanish rather than of an English type, with a Celtic intensity of manner which contrasted with the Saxon phlegm of Abercrombie Smith. Only a faint, I think, said the medical student. Just give me a hand with him. You take his feet. Now on to the sofa. You can kick all those little wooden devils off. What a litter it is. Now he will be all right if we undo his collar and give him some water. What has he been up to at all? I don't know. I heard him cry out. I ran up. I know him pretty well, you know. It's very good of you to come down. His heart is going like a pair of castanets, said Smith, laying his hand on the breast of the unconscious man. He seems to me to be frightened all to pieces. Chuck the water over him. What a face he has got on him. It was indeed a strange and most repellent face, for colour and outline were equally unnatural. It was white, not with the ordinary pallor of fear, but with an absolutely bloodless white like the white of an underside of a soul. He was very fat, but gave the impression of having some time been considerably fatter, for his skin hung loosely in creases and folds, and was shot with a meshwork of wrinkles. Short, stubby brown hair bristled up from his scalp, with a pair of thick, wrinkled ears protruding on either side. His light grey eyes were still open, the pupils dilated and the balls projecting in a fixed and horrid stare. It seemed to Smith, as he looked down upon him, that he had never seen nature's danger signals flying so plainly upon a man's countenance, and his thoughts turned more seriously to the warning which Hasty had given him an hour before. "'What the deuce can have frightened him so?' he asked. "'It's the mummy.' "'The mummy? How, then?' "'I don't know. It's beastly and morbid. I wish he would drop it. It's the second fright he's given me.' It was the same last winter. I found him just like this, with that horrid thing in front of him. What does he want with a mummy, then? Oh, he's a crank, you know. It's his hobby. He knows more about these things than any man in England. But I wish he wouldn't. Ah, he's beginning to come, too. A faint tinge of colour had begun to steal back into Bellingham's ghastly cheeks, and his eyelids shivered like a sail after a calm. He clasped and unclasped his hands, drew a long, thin breath between his teeth, and suddenly jerking up his head threw a glance of recognition around him. As his eyes fell upon the mummy, he sprang off the sofa, seized the roll of papyrus, thrust it into a drawer, turned the key, and then staggered back onto the sofa. "'What's up?' he asked. "'What do you chaps want?' "'You've been shrieking out and making no end of a fuss,' said Monkhouse Lee. "'If our neighbour here from above hadn't come down, I'm sure I don't know what I would have done with you.' "'Ah, it's Abercrombie Smith,' said Bellingham, glancing up at him. "'How very good of you to come in. What a fool I am. Oh, my God, what a fool I am.' He sunk his head onto his hands 
and burst into peal after peal of hysterical laughter. "'Look here, drop it!' cried Smith, shaking him roughly by the shoulder. "'Your nerves are all in a jangle. You must drop these little midnight games with mummies, or you'll be going off your chump. You're all on wires now.' "'I wonder,' said Bellingham, "'whether you would be as cool as I am if you had seen... "'What, then?' "'Oh, nothing. I meant that I wonder if you could sit up at night with a mummy without trying your nerves. "'I have no doubt that you are quite right. "'I dare say that I have been taking out of myself too much lately. "'But I am all right now. "'Please don't go, though. "'Just wait for a few minutes until I am quite myself.' "'The room is very close,' remarked Lee, "'throwing open the window and letting in the cool night air.' "'It's balsamic resin,' said Bellingham. "'He lifted up one of the dried palmate leaves from the table "'and frizzled it over the chimney of the lamp. "'It broke away into heavy smoke wreaths "'and a pungent, biting odour filled the chamber. "'It's the sacred plant, the plant of the priests,' he remarked. "'Do you know anything of Eastern languages, Smith? "'Nothing at all, not a word.' "'The answer seemed to lift a weight from the Egyptologist's mind.' "'By the way,' he continued, "'how long was it from the time that you ran down "'until I came to my senses?' "'Not long, some four or five minutes.' "'I thought it could not be very long,' said he, "'drawing a long breath. "'But what a strange thing unconsciousness is. "'There's no measurement to it. "'I could not tell from my own sensations "'if it were seconds or weeks. "'Now that gentleman on the table "'was packed up in the days of the 11th dynasty "'some forty centuries ago.' And yet, if he could find his tongue, he would tell us that this lapse of time has been but a closing of the eyes and a reopening of them. He is a singularly fine mummy, Smith. Smith stepped over to the table and looked down with a professional eye at the black and twisted form in front of him. The features, though horribly discoloured, were perfect, and two little nut-like eyes still lurked in the depths of the black hollow sockets. The blotched skin was drawn tightly from bone to bone, and a tangled wrap of black coarse hair fell over the ears. Two thin teeth, like those of a rat, overlay the shriveled lower lip. In its crouching position, with bent joints and a craned head, there was a suggestion of energy about the horrid thing, which made Smith's gorge rise. The gaunt ribs with their parchment-like covering were exposed, and the sunken, leaden-hued abdomen with the long slit where the embalmer had left his mark. But the lower limbs were wrapped around with coarse yellow bandages. A number of little clove-like pieces of myrrh and of cassia were sprinkled over the body and lay scattered on the inside of the case. "'I don't know his name,' said Bellingham, passing his hand over the shriveled head. "'You see, the outer sarcophagus with the inscriptions is missing. Lot 249 is all the title he has now. You see it printed on his case. That was his number in the auction at which I picked him up. "'He has been a very pretty sort of fellow in his day,' remarked Abercrombie Smith. "'He has been a giant. His mummy is six foot seven in length, and that would be a giant over there, for they never were a very robust race. Feel those great knotted bones, too. He would be a nasty fellow to tackle. "'Perhaps these very hands helped to build the stones into the pyramid,' suggested Monkhouse Lee, looking down with disgust in his eyes at the crooked, unclean talons.' No fear, this fellow has been pickled in natron and looked after in the most approved style. They did not serve hodsmen in that fashion. Sale or bitumen was enough for them. It has been calculated that this sort of thing cost about £730 in our money. Our friend was a noble at least. What do you make of that small inscription near his feet, Smith? I told you that I know no eastern tongue. Ah, so you did. It's the name of the embalmer, I take it. A very conscientious worker he must have been. I wonder how many modern works will survive 4,000 years. He kept on speaking lightly and rapidly, but it was evident to Abercrombie Smith that he was still palpitating with fear. His hand shook, his lower lip trembled, and look where he would, his eye always came sliding round to his gruesome companion. Through all his fear, however, there was a suspicion of triumph in his tone and manner. His eyes shone, and his footstep as he paced the room was brisk and jaunty. He gave the impression of a man who has gone through an ordeal, the marks of which he still bears upon him, but which has helped him to his end. "'You're not going yet,' he cried as Smith rose from the sofa. At the prospect of solitude, his fears seemed to crowd back upon him, 
and he stretched out a hand to detain him. Yes, I must go. I have my work to do. You're all right now. I think that with your nervous system you should take up some less morbid study. Oh, I am not nervous as a rule, and I have unwrapped mummies before. You fainted last time, observed Monkhouse Lee. Ah, yes, so I did. Well, I must have had a nerve tonic or a course of electricity. You're not going, Lee? I'll do whatever you wish, Ned. Then I'll come down with you and have a shakedown on your sofa. Good night, Smith. I'm so sorry to have disturbed you with my foolishness. They shook hands, and as the medical student stumbled up the spiral irregular stair, he heard a key turn in a door, and the steps of his two new acquaintances as they descended to the lower floor. Black Clock Audio Tales Edited by Daniel Spitzer Black Clock Audio Tales is a PGTTCM production. Find us on the web at pgttcm.com and at Black Clock Audio on Instagram, Twitter, and the Facebook. And Black Clock Audio Tales on YouTube.